Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Wilson Center. My name is Nilda Galagis. I'm Senior Associate for the European Studies Program. Um, and I'm very happy to have uh, back with us today three, uh, three former scholars and one current scholar. Uh, so this is sort of a Wilson Center um, history and public policy reunion <laughs> in, in some sense. Um, uh, Christian Osterman, Director of European Studies and History and Public Policy, regrets that he, he wouldn't be able to attend today at the last minute, so I'm pinch hitting for him and happy to do so. Uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, uh, Vladimir Tispanianu's latest book, The Devil in History, Communism, Fascism, and Some Lessons for the 20th, of the 20th Century. Um, so we're very pleased to have you back today. Let me just quickly, I think most of you are familiar with, with all three of our um, speakers today, but let me just quickly um, uh, present uh, Vladimir Tispanianu to you. He is, the form he is a former uh, Wilson Center Fellow and Professor of Politics and Director of the Center for the Study of Post-Communist Studies uh, Societies at the University of Maryland in College Park. He's also the Chairman of the Presidential Commission for the Analysis of the Communist Dictatorship in Romania and the President of the Scientific Council of the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes in the Memory of the Romanian Exile. Was. <laughs> Was, okay. <laughs> Um, University of Maryland awarded him the Distinguished Scholar Teacher Award as well as the Distinguished International Service Award. In addition to the book that we are going to discuss today, uh, Vladimir is also the author of numerous publications including The Crisis of Marxist Ideology in Eastern Europe, The Poverty of Utopia, Reinventing Politics, Eastern Europe from Stalin to Havel, Fantasies of Salvation, Nationalism, Democracy, and the Myth of Post-Communist Europe, Stalinism for All Seasons, A Political History of, a Romanian Commun of Romanian Communism, uh, which uh, incidentally was awarded the Barbara Yelovich Award by the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies. Um, uh, most recently, uh, Vladimir was the author of the end, and the end and the Beginning, The Revolutions of 1989 and the Resurgence of History, and, the, and of course, today's book, The Devil, the Devil in History. Um, so let me turn the floor over to you, and uh, we'll then hear from uh, Dennis Delatant and Charles King. So you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Nida. Thanks, Christian, in absentia. Uh, thanks uh, those who, during a very special day, uh, found the time uh, to come to the Woodrow Wilson Center for this uh, discussion on what I consider to be still very, uh, very seminal issues. Uh, I should uh, start by simply saying that uh, this has been a uh, an enduring and uh, uh, quite uh, almost compulsive, if you want, uh, project for me. Uh, I've been uh, thinking about uh, the relationship between what uh, a famous Polish writer once called Gemini Totalitari, the totalitarian twins, for practically all my uh, ad adult intellectual life. And uh, I think it remains one of the most uh, disturbingly uh, timely issues. After all, if I may start with a uh, reference to the recently passed away uh, historian Eric Hobsbawm, uh, uh, and I'll probably share with you a few uh, recollections about uh, Mr. Hobsbawm, uh, he was right. Yes, he's not the, he was not the only one, and we have at least two reviewers here of Hobsbawm's uh, uh, life and works. We have Charles King, who reviewed his memoirs in, the, in TLS, and we have Ron Radosh, who also wrote about uh, Eric Hobsbawm. He was right in the age of extremes, I think, that uh, indeed the 20th century started with the, um, the um, World War I, and uh, I would share with you my own recollection of, uh, of a conference we had in Potsdam, which was itself a, uh, emblematic for the problems that we discuss here. Uh, so World War I started uh, a new century. It was not the turn of the century, but basically, as Hobson argued, and I think he was right, it was the age of capitalism that basically lasted between uh, or the age of liberal democracy or the age of imperialism, the way you want to call it, okay, uh, revolutions and imperialism that lasted between the French Revolution and World War I, and then you have the age of extremes that started with the with World War One and uh, arguably ended with the revolutions of 1989-1991 that basically 
ended or gave a closure to a uh, certain cycle of uh, European and global history. Uh, some other historians would call it the long European civil war that uh, became a planetary war. And here is not only Ernst Nolte, but important authors like Sigmund Neumann, a German emigre who wrote about the globalization of civil war in the 1930s, so much earlier than Ernst Nolte. OK, so since I mentioned that conference, where I spent uh, quite a bit of time in uh, conversations with, uh, with uh, Eric Hobsbawm, it was quite interesting. The conference was organized, and I'll go back into this was organized at the uh, Einstein Forum in 2005 by two major scholars involved in European history, one of them, and the other one in interested in the problem of evil. Uh, the scholar interested in the problem of European history was uh, one of the three uh, scholars to whom I dedicate this book, The Devil in History, and his name was, of course, Tony Judd. Uh, and I, when I say, of course, because I think that Tony Judd was indeed the consummate European intellectual and uh, emblematic as a historian of Europe uh, for our times. The other person was Susan Neyman, who runs the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, and she wrote uh, two books, to the best of my knowledge, on the problem of evil, including the problem of radical evil. Among the participants in, the, in this conference, in addition, of course, to, I mentioned Eric Hobsbawm, Tony Judd, Susan Neyman, among the participants in the conference should have been, but he couldn't make it, a Spanish writer and former leader, of, one of the leaders of the Spanish Communist Party, I have in mind Jorge Semprún. Uh, Jorge Semprún, uh, that some of you know, of course, the name, uh, passed away last year. Uh, he was a, uh, came from an intellectual Spanish communist, uh, well, his father was actually a socialist, uh, family. As a young man, he studied after the end of the Spanish Civil War. He studied philosophy in France, joined the French resistance, was deported to Buchenwald, and wrote one of the most impressive books about Buchenwald. It's called The Long Voyage, translated into English as A Long Journey. Uh, Semprún became a member of the Politburo of the Spanish Communist Party, and you can read uh, the translation of his book about his experience there. He was one of those who, uh, in a way or not, discovered the God that failed a little bit later. And he wrote a book which is called in French, The L'Autobiographie de Federico Sanchez, in translating into English, Communism in Spain during the times of Franco. Uh, he couldn't make it, uh, or at least that appeared that he couldn't make it. Probably he had problems that I didn't realize, uh, because among the participants was a person with the name Marcus Wolf. Now, some of you remember this uh, gentleman's name, uh, Marcus or Misha Wolf, uh, who was himself coming from a very famous German communist family and whose uh, father was a doctor and, uh, and so on and so forth. OK, and the writer Friedrich Wolf. And uh, Misha Wolf grew up in Moscow at the same uh, place, together with Wolfgang Leonard, the author of uh, Child of the Revolution. Then uh, there is a wonderful chapter in Anne Applebaum's uh, new book about the the establishment or the uh, takeover of radio in uh, the Soviet zone of occupation. Uh, now, I think this is absolutely fantastic because the first thing the Soviets did when they occupied Berlin, first of all, they made sure that the radio building would not be bombed. That was very important. The second thing is they occupied immediately. They brought a team from Moscow, Leonhard, including and Misha Wolf, and they fired only the broadcasters who were particularly nasty Nazis, very few. I mean, they're all of them Nazi party members, but very few were really very, very vocal. So therefore, those were fired. Uh, and then the operation continued, but this time as a communist propaganda operation, with the same voices, the same speakers, etc., etc. OK, so, uh, so Misha Wolf was there, and uh, I watched him very carefully, because he, for me, embodied some of the problems that I was dealing with when I started working on this project. And by the way, I want to thank the Wilson Center as, as warmly as I can uh, for offering me the possibility when I was a fellow here. I was working on two projects at that moment, but this took me over, so to, so to speak, seized my passion. And uh, so I consider it very much as a result, uh, uh, the book a result of my time at the Woodrow Wilson Center. As a fact, I went uh, upstairs before coming here and I offered a copy for the library. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so I, uh, at that conference, we discussed, and among the participants were Jan Gross and Tim Snyder and other people who are very well known for their work on this topic. So at that conference, I was very interested in how Marcus Wolf is going to deal. The, the title of the conference was Open Wounds. 
so we deal with the problem of open wounds. So, uh, and I personally would challenge the Hobbesbomian, let's say, approach, and I would say that actually the 20th century is not over. So if the 20th century is not over, we are discussing problems that belong to the 20th century that clearly spill over into the 21st century. So I don't think this is a history book that I'm presenting, uh, that I wrote, and uh, that my distinguished colleagues are going to comment upon after I finish my uh, 30 minutes uh, designated time. Okay, so uh, the book is basically, I think, very much a book about the 21st century uh, and trying uh, if you want, I don't want to go into the scene of, uh, of immodest modesty, uh, as, uh, as Jan Plumper nicely calls Stalin's behavior. Okay, so, uh, but I would simply say that I don't uh, claim to have the lesson, so that, that was the initial title, and then I realized that was hubris. I mean, to say that I know the lessons of the 20th century, that really, that means I would be God, uh, or the devil. Okay, so... Uh, the first thing I want to say, the title, and then I'll go a little bit into some, uh, some thesis to the book that probably Charles and Dennis are going to highlight better than the author can do. Uh, the title is very much inspired and is actually used with the permission of the late uh, Leszek Kowakowski. Uh, one of the texts that impressed me the most uh, in Kowakowski's immense and uh, immensely instructive work uh, was an interview that he gave to George Urban. George Urban served for many years as director of Radio for Europe. He uh, was a philosopher, uh, journalist, and then political scientist, a very, very bright man. I say it was because I'm not sure that he's done. I hope he is. Okay, but anyway, so I, the, I used this term, and then I found several essays by Kolakowski that inspired me very much. As a matter of fact, this morning I received a message from somebody uh, who brought to my attention that there is a book published in the 19th century, probably in 1870, with the title The Devil in History. And uh, it's about, uh, yes, it's called Satan's Steps in History and looking at world history as the domain of the devil. Uh, this is very Hegelian, if you want, because in Hegel, if you look into Hegel's uh, philosophy of history, history basically advances through, its, uh, through the wrong side, through the dark pages. Eventually, of course, there is a redemption at the end, because there is an end of history, and, all the, and then we find out uh, that reason needed the sac sacrifices in, with its cunning, with its developing in history, uh, and that's the reason to quote Hegel in the philosophy of history, that's the reason... Uh, Alexander had to die of, uh, I don't know, typhus, and then uh, Jesus had to be crossed, and Napoleon had to die in St. Helena, okay, because history had to achieve its goals. Uh, so I try to understand what is the province, what is this working of devil in history. Uh, and the first thing I tried reading Kolakowski was to say, to, to, I was wondering whether he's uh, using a metaphor. Uh, after all, Kolakowski was a very ironical writer, and he was a you know, not only a great philosopher, but he was also a very gifted writer, you know, fiction writer, including fiction writer. Uh, so uh, parables and stuff like that. Okay, so very Kafka-like parables. Okay, so I, I, I was interested whether he meant it as a metaphor or an allegory or a parable or whatever else. Uh, and uh, guess what? Uh, he said very clearly, no. Uh, my generation, our generation, experienced the presence of devil in history. And then I realized that, and, uh, as a matter of fact, in this interview and other writings, Kolakowski says the following. Uh, there are two devils in my account. First, history's stubborn inclination to frustrate and reverse human ambition. That's one thing. And the second, Marx's chimerical utopian notion that the revolutionary movement of the world proletariat will somehow abolish all ideological, social, and economic contradictions of past society and usher in the golden age. So this is basically, if you want, diabolical hubris or diabolical, uh, to use the Mark Lillas uh, term, uh, di uh, diabolical recklessness or whatever the best term for this would be. Okay, so this is the, ti the title. Uh, why do I bring together communism and fascism? Having uh, been fully aware uh, during my uh, year, almost a year I spent in Paris in uh, 19... 
81 through 1982, uh, I didn't have much money, and I didn't, but I have plenty of time at that moment. So I attended some of the wonderful last series of lectures by Raymond Aron at, uh, at the, I think it was at the Collège de France. Okay, so at that uh, moment, uh, I remember, because that's the moment when Raymond Aron publicly made a statement, not in front of me, but I read some of his, and you can find it in his memoir, Spectateur Engagé, or I don't know what's translated into English, Engaged Spectator. Okay, uh, in Ma Aron's memoirs he said, for many years in my life, I protested the attempt to put, to bring together, to put on the same umbrella, communism and fascism. And the argument, let's call it the intentionality argument, was that communism has, Aron says, a very different intentions. It has a humanist intention, or at least it can be claimed to be a humanist intention, while national socialist fascism in general uh, does not have it. Uh, now, by the end of my career, I think I was wrong, says Aron. And he basically elaborated on that. So I, that's one thing that is very puzzling. Why the reluctance of the people? So it was a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question I have, and I try to respond to it in the book. Why there is this reluctance of people to accept uh, the very comparability I don't speak here about, please don't misunderstand me, I never say in the book, and I, uh, I can quote a lot from the book, that there are two systems, ideological systems, or to use another term, ideocratic systems, uh, praise be the memory of uh, Martin Malia, uh, okay, the two ideocracies, or the, the two, actually Malia used the term, ideocratic partocracies, because they were at the same time, pa the party was ran supreme and so on, the two systems are in many respects similar. For me, the more I started to look into that, the more surprised I was why this reluctance. Why this is a reluctance and there was no problem, for instance, for people like the great, probably one of the greatest Russian novelists of all times, and definitely one of the greatest of the 20th century, Vasily Grossman in his life, and Fate, the novel that I'm sure many people here read, uh, he doesn't have this problem. Uh, if you go into the great movie, The Pianist, uh, Polanski's movie, okay, so you have the diary of the Nazi officer, the guy who saves, basically, Spielmann in the film, and the text was published. This is a guy who was a... Um, German officer who was not a committed Nazi, actually he was an educator, he was a teacher, high school teacher, and his diary basically discovers the similarity, to say it, to put it very, very mildly, between the two. Okay, so uh, simply put, since I don't have more than 10 minutes, I suspect, okay, so uh, I'll give you a few theses about the book and then I'll uh, listen very carefully to what the two commentators, who are both of them uh, very highly regarded scholars, and I thank them very much for coming here, uh, have to say. So uh, first, and, uh, the, for, uh, the first thing, okay, so why did I write this book? I wrote, I wrote this book because I am a little bit tired of the... Uh, attempts to dismiss the totalitarian paradigm, presenting, pres uh, you know, basically caricaturing it, turning it into what it, it never was, or at least it never was in Hannah Arendt's writings. It never was in the great German emigre wave writings of people who had experienced it first, first, first hand, uh, the, the German uh, experience. It never was a uh, caricature in, let's say, the great testimony that uh, somebody like a, a survivor of both, uh, of both concentration camp systems, of both the Soviet one and the Nazi one, like the uh, German writer and, and uh, witness, who was Margarete Buber Neumann, I mean, after all, she wrote a book which is called Under Two Di Dictators. I mean, and she was first arrest arrested in the Soviet Union, the Great Purge, uh, sent to, uh, to, to Siberia, to the Gulag, and I try to avoid technical names and so on, sent to the Gulag, and then after the signing of the, uh, of the pact in August 1939, basically together with other German communists, she was transported uh, to an unknown destination, and the unknown destination happened to be Ravensbrück, okay, in which she basically shared at a certain moment her, uh, her, uh, 
Barak with Milena Yesenska, Kafka's friend, and actually she wrote a wonderful book years later, which is called My Friend Milena Yesenska, who died in the concentration camp. And to say something about Milena Yesenska, those of you who know about IVM in Vienna, the Institute for the uh, St whatever it's called for the Sciences of Men, uh, know that there is a very famous fellowship for journalism in uh, in, in Vienna, which is the Milena Yesenska uh, Fellowship. And Milena Yesenska was a left wing. She was Kafka's great love, okay? So the letters to Milena belong to the best in the history of 20th century literature, okay? So Milena Yesenska in 1939, when the pact was signed, was among those who said, basically, this is the end of any illusion I can have about these two monsters, okay? So there were people, there were lots of people, basically, uh, who understood uh, what these two systems had in common. So they represented two types of totalitarianism. I make an argument that we have to uh, somehow revisit the totalitarian paradigm and without making it, in, uh, turning it into an absolute, because I think that there are points in the critiques of totalitarianism that have to be taken into account, uh, especially the diachronic component of totalitarianism, that means the temporal component, the fact that the totalitarian model was never frozen completely. So I don't remember who said it, but said it very well. So let me take it, I think it's Adam Michnik who said it. There's never a completely, or maybe Hannah Arendt, but doesn't matter who is the author of this, but I think it's a perfect uh, description. There's only one perfect totalitarian universe and that's called the concentration camp. The concentration camp is the fully, full-fledged. Otherwise, it's always imperfect totalitarianism. And, you know, even under Nazi, uh, you know, the Nazi regime, it was imperfect. Even in Romania under Ceausescu, it was imperfect totalitarianism. Even in Romania under Gheorghe Udej in the 1950s, it was still imperfect. There were still things that the totalitarians wanted to achieve. The problem is the intention. Intentionally, totalitarianism was overwhelming and all-pervasive. That's the key element. Okay, both were so, the communism and fascism for me represent two types of totalitarianism. Both were tested in Eastern Europe during the most violent, and by Eastern Europe here I also mean uh, the Soviet Union, so the whole region. So if you want to use Timothy, uh, Timothy Snyder's uh, term, in the bloodlands, okay? So uh, a, br a brutal century recorded in human history. The legacies of these ideologies, movements, and regimes continue, I think, to uh, haunt collective memories. So we are uh, just because of the, uh, the, the work of memory has not come to an end. The debates around, for instance, the Prague Declaration, which was adopted, uh, it's very, very interesting that those who criticize the Prague Declaration, which was adopted in 2009, if I'm not uh, uh, wrong, uh, about unifying the two European memories and bringing together the memory of National Socialism, of Fascism, and the memory of Communism, which, by the way, they had to change the term into the memory of Stalinism, which is completely wrong historically because uh, there were horrible massacres that took place under Lenin, and so this is fully documented today. But okay, I understand the pressure, so they changed in the memory of Stalinism, you know, 10 years of Soviet experience were obliterated easily from the memory again. Okay, so, but they, people say always, it's very convenient to say that, uh, and I had some arguments on BBC and so on, I don't want to give names because they are not present here, and it's not fair to criticize, because they said, oh, this is the declaration that those Lithuanian and Latvians and so on put together and so on, but they are all nostalgics of National Socialism. Uh, to which I said, first of all, the only Lithuanian, to the best of my knowledge, who was an author of the Prague Declaration was President Vitautas Landsbergis, ex-president. He was not a nostalgic of National Socialism, emphatically, I said. Second, the two other persons who authored the Prague Declaration, the first signatories, was Václav Havel and Joachim Gauck. So the former president of the Czech Republic, a hero of East European dis descent, and a person whom nobody could suspect of any kind of nostalgia for either Stalinism, Leninism, or National Socialism, and Joachim Gauck, who is the current president of Germany and who was a dissident priest in East Germany and who doesn't have any kind of nostalgia for either National Socialism and so on. So this, what I'm trying to say is these are not simply arcane and obsolete issues. They continue to be part of the public discourse in Europe and not only in Europe. So, uh, 
this would be a major point I wanted to make. Second, both communism and fascism, the way I discuss them, and there's a whole chapter here about in the book, both fascism and communism were purifying utopias. Both were expressions of what I would call uh, millenarian, to use an easier term, or if you, sorry, this is a book that uses a lot of theological language, and I had to go into that, okay? So I had to train myself into both theology and meta-theology. Meta so basically, and to go to some of the great books, I'm, I was very pleased that I had to discover books by Norman Kohn and so on and so forth. So I went into the classics of the 50s and so on, so it was a very rewarding experience, I can tell you. Okay, so both were expressions of chiliastic hubris, of anti-systemic outbursts of frustration, and here's a key word that I'm using and I try to develop. So what kind of book? It's not a classic history book. I was extremely uh, gratified to have a review in Times Higher Education written by one of the greatest historians of our times, who made sure to emphasize that it's not a history book. Uh, it's a political philosophical book. I mean, Richard Overy, uh, who is the author of the book Dictators. And so, you know, I was, and it was one of the cleanest uh, reviews because, you know, I was, uh, I was very scared when I said, okay, how is Overy going to react to, to that? And it was a, a very, very interesting review. Both were, to use the term of a great uh, scholar of fascism, those were movements of rebirth or movements of revival or revivalist movements or movements of regeneration. Both saw the world as decadent, as decaying, as degenerate, and they used this term specifically, and therefore the issue was to redeem humanity. How to redeem humanity? So basically one had a uh, redemptive sociology, the other one had a, a redemptive biology. Okay, so I'm using here, I'm hinting to Saul, Fr Saul Friedlander's uh, explanation of Nazi anti-Semitism as redemptive anti-Semitism. This is his, uh, his term, and I think it's uh, very appropriate. Okay, uh, both were, uh, and here I pay tribute to one of the great uh, source of inspiration for my own work, uh, the late French historian François Furet. Uh, okay, so I took from, from Furet and conversations I had with him on these issues, uh, I took both uh, these two um, ideologies and movements as, as um, uh, fundamentally pathologies of modernity. So, uh, I know, pathology is already, I, I, it's normative. I, buy, it's, I pass a value judgment, which I take responsibility for, for. So one was basically an universalistic pathology of modernity, and the other one was a particularistic. That's a theme that I borrowed from François Fioré, whom, of course, I uh, quote. Both had some relationship to the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is a key element in discussing. Both were reactions to the Enlightenment. Communism was a reaction pretending to fulfill Enlightenment, and uh, fascism was fundamentally a reaction against Enlightenment. It was the culmination of what Isaiah Berlin called the project of counter-Enlightenment. Uh, another element which is extremely important for our discussion here is that both tried, and this is very important for what the situation, our situation, or they'll say this, uh, to use Karl Jaspers' his famous uh, title, the spiritual situation of our times. Uh, both try to transcend what we call democratic capitalist liberal values. That's the, that's a fact. And that defines both movements to the surprise of many people, and that's the way I approach them, as revolutionary movements. Hitler was a revolutionary. I don't want to discuss here left and right, because there are elements of the left in Hitler's project, and there are elements. The second person that I dedicate my book, in addition to Tony Judd, the second person I dedicate uh, the book is, uh, there are three of them. So one is Judd, one is Kolakowski, and one is Robert uh, C. Tucker. In his extraordinary, unsurpassed Stalin biography, unfortunately unfinished Stalin biography, in the second volume of the Stalin biography, Robert C. Tucker, who was my personal mentor, so to speak, uh, or not so to speak, to confess. Okay, so Robert C. Tucker discussed the concept of Bolshevism of the far right. And he discovered in Stalin's Bolshevism during the last stage of Stalin's life, basically the resurgence of topics, themes, motives, and obsessions that belonged to the Russian far right in the pre-Bolshevik, pre-revolutionary times. So both were, uh, and this is an important element and I discuss extensively, revolutionary anthropological projects. Both tried very hard to propose a vision of a, um, new human condition. And the price for this, to achieve this human, uh, human condition, would never be too high. 
because this is such an extraordinary uh, goal that fundamentally and eventually would sanctify somehow and would uh, redeem basically all the huge sacrifices that were made in order to achieve it. Neither National Socialism nor Communism in its Marxist or any of other incarnations, we speak about modern communism, not about Plato's communism, okay, or whatever, Campanella's communism, uh, okay, neither of them had economic purposes as the chief purposes. Economy was a, a means to achieve an end. Obviously, it was important, but it was a means. The years ago, uh, three students of Georg Lukács, who broke with Lukács, uh, at a certain moment, or uh, posthumously, Agnes Heller, uh, Ferenc Feher, her husband, and Georg Markus wrote a book which was, call was called Dictatorship Over Needs. Mm -hmm. The issue was to control human needs. That's the reason you establish a command economy. It's not because you are in love with command economy. The command economy is subordinated to the ideological goals of the system. This is the key element. People will say, how about China uh, today? Uh, all the market-oriented reforms in China, as we have seen from the fate of Xi uh, uh, Laos, whatever his name is, uh, are reversible. All of them are based on state control over land and properties. So, yes, you have market incentives and so on, but when the party state decides to step in, it can step in and change everything overnight. So China, for me, it's still in the stage of post-totalitarianism, obviously. It, it's a much more pluralized space than totalitarianism, but it's not, by any stretch of the imagination, a pluralist society. Okay, so uh, since I come to, uh, to the end, okay, uh, Totalitarianism, what does it mean? So how do I see it? I see it, first of all, as a, an ideology. The key element, so my question here is how was, how was it possible? How was it possible? And the answer is it was possible because, because large human beings under certain social, moral, political conditions can get intoxicated with ideology or inebriated with ideology. I think the key answer to this is, let's say, the ideological inebriation or the ideological opiate or the whatever, to use our own famous term, famous term. So this is the reason I dedicated to the three persons because I think that ideology basically what does is not simply uh, radical. I don't mean any ideology. I don't speak here about, you know, kind of banal ideology. I speak about, uh, I remember the late German political scientist for many years, uh, president of the LSE, of London School of Economics, Ralph Darendorf said, liberalism is a cold project. Fascism and communism are warm projects. And they are warm. I mean, they make people palpitate, okay? So they make the, you know, the, the, the heart, uh, I don't know how to put it, get warm and bleed, okay? So uh, that's, that's what makes them. So both of them symbolize the sacralization of history, the celebration of an absorbing totality, be it the messianic proletarian class to be, to be sacralized, or the Aryan race, or the Italian nation, with its roots in in uh, in the Latin, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, imperial age, and uh, so on and so forth. So to conclude, comparing does not mean obfuscating the difference, but on the contrary, highlighting them as L, as well as shared features. Uh, I totally agree with what Tim Snyder once said that uh, those who reject the comparison are already engaged in a comparison. Uh, by simply rejecting the legitimacy of the comparison, you engage in a comparison, okay? You say something about your own values, okay? Because comparing does not mean identifying, does not mean forgetting the differences. And I always say, and it's one of the things that I've always thought about, uh, and with this I'll finish, uh, as I promised. Uh, and there are two of my students, probably more, but two students here. I always emphasize that I say that the most important political document of the 20th century, uh, obviously it's Mein Kampf, obviously it's uh, uh, State and Revolution by Lenin, but in terms of its effects, immediate effects, was Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th Party Congress in February 1956. I remember having given a talk here on the 50th anniversary. Okay, uh, so... Uh, for me, I always said, this is the way communism, you know, that came to power, came to the world by word, perished by word. 
uh, I'm not going to go into details. Kolakowski once said, this is the moment when millions of true believers were told that he who had been celebrated as the greatest scientist, great linguist, greatest mathematician, greatest you name, you know, strategist, etc., 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 turned out to be nothing but a uh, genocidal sociopath. Okay, that's something shocking. Okay, some people committed suicide. They were Ron Rogers here, the divorces of the 20th Congress, and so on and so forth. Now, my question, and with this I'll finish, and I address it a little bit in the book. Could one imagine, and this is the beginning of a major difference between the two, because I compare and then I contrast. Could one imagine that assuming Germany had won the war uh, and uh, Adolf Hitler would have died in 1953 and Martin Bormann would have been uh, elected Führer or anointed, better said, Führer. Uh, in 1956, could one imagine the equivalent of the 20th Congress of the National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany, in which Parteigenosse Bormann, to deplore the great violations of National Socialist legality, overcoming the great traditions of the original doctrine that had been betrayed somehow, by Hitler in the second part of his life, of course, not in the first, because initially he was a good Nazi, but then he became, I'm paraphrasing Khrushchev. Uh, it's an open question. I think that's very hard to imagine such a thing, because communism always had, and this is, and here lies the problem, communism had always had a refuge to go back to, into something which was pure and humanist and intentionally good. The problem is, and here we go back into the meta-theology, to the uh, philosopher who was, uh, that's what my friends who are Dostoevsky scholars say, was the inspiration for Dostoevsky when he wrote uh, The Brothers Karamazov. Vladimir Solovyov was the inspiration for Alyosha Karamazov. Uh, Vladimir Solovyov said the problem is not uh, that the devil uh, abolishes the distinction between good and evil. The problem is that the devil falsifies good. And this is what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from uh, Dallas Denetant, who was a former senior scholar with the Cold War International History Project here at the Wilson Center. And he's currently the visiting Jan Ratiu Professor of Romanian Studies at Georgetown University and Emer Emeritus Professor of Romanian Studies at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College in London. I, I give you the floor. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Nida, and uh, I'd like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for giving me an opportunity to return uh, here to talk about Vladimir's uh, most perceptive study. Um, Vladimir has already admitted that his book is really a book about ideas uh, and not about historical or specific historical events. I myself need to admit that I'm not a political scientist or I don't see myself as one. I'm rather a historian and that is the spirit in which I'll offer my observations on uh, Vladimir's book. Uh, Vladimir's already said that he owes much in treating this subject to uh, Ernst Nolte and Francois Furet. Again, their approach to the genealogy of the two movements of fascism and communism is much more historically based than uh, Vladimir's own ideological, one might say, approach to the comparisons and contradictions between communism and fascism. Um, I'd like to make uh, seven or eight points. And the first is that, uh, I'm, I'm going to quote from uh, Vladimir himself, he writes, Marxism as a political idea was a failure from the beginning because of its lack of sensitivity to the psychological makeup of mankind and because it underestimates the needs of many for deep spiritual or cultural sources of meaning and thus the profound importance of the human right to privacy. That last uh, part of the sentence, I think, is particularly important when we're looking at the impact of totalitarian regimes on society. This intrusion of both... Uh, communism and fascism into the daily lives of people. And of course, it's no accident that both types of ideology, both types of regime, had formidable secret police forces, which, reside, uh, which relied very much on 
instilling fear into the population. Um, fear is a great labour-saving device. And, of course, we know from access to uh, Soviet documents and the documents of uh, fascist regimes, such as those in Romania, that the police relied on hordes of informers to make their work a lot easier. Um, indeed, there are many Gestapo reports from Dresden, for example, from 1937-38, where officers actually say, isn't it great that we get so many denunciations from our fellow citizens? Uh, we can take some time off this afternoon, for example. Um, so that's one point I'd like to make, which um, Vladimir alludes to, I think, in his book, but perhaps could have developed a, a little more. The, the second point was that although Vladimir says that all fascists shared a common, pon a common bond in the idea of leadership, their abhorrence of liberalism and belief in ultranationalism, um, perhaps he could have said more, I think, about what exactly German and Italian fascism uh, had in common or how different their worldviews were. Um, we know, of course, that Mussolini had little interest in racial theory, that the position of Jews in Italy was certainly easier, one might say, than in Nazi Germany. And anti-Semitism did not reach the intensity that it did. Uh, that is, anti-Semitism anti in Italy didn't reach the intensity that it did in Nazi Germany. Um, German National Socialism, I would say, although similar to Italian fascism, fascism was mark markedly different to it. Uh, National Socialism's ideology saw the party's role as corporately giving and demanding unconditional loyalty to the Fuhrer, not only as the source of the party's ideology, but also as the embodiment of the people. And the function of the ideology was to establish the absolute authority of the Fuhrer as the incarnation of the spirit of the German people. It was not to maintain constitutional law or practices. The German citizen was subordinated to this machine, and this machine to the party, the party to the Fuhrer, and the Fuhrer to his own demon. The Nazis tapped every hidden mental disposition in the German people's collective psyche that could be used to shore up their contention that Hitler and National Socialism represented Germany's deepest wishes. The Nazi party was the institutionalized expression of the sovereign will but the party did not claim to be sovereign. It claimed only to be the vehicle by which that will became reality. And with its emphasis on spontaneity of mystical participation in the life of the state, of the virtues of initiative, of trust, the party had a degree of innate combustion unsuited to the state of forms of constitutional law. So within Nazism, there could be no conception of a corporate leadership. Hitler's policies or his decisions were his own and could never be directed. And the internal politics of the Nazi party were therefore a struggle for Hitler's ear, a struggle that generally Heinrich Himmler won. Now, those points I've just enunciated, many of them are made by Martin Malia, whom um, Vladimir uh, quoted and mentioned um, in his concluding remarks, and so they're not um, original points of mine. I've taken them or adapted uh, some of them, not all of them, some of them from Martin Malia's works, but I think they're points which Vladimir, whom he who reveres Martin, could have perhaps made mention of in his book. Um, the third point, if communism and fascism merged into, as Vladimir says, a Baroque synthesis, um, there are key distinctions which Vladimir, I think, quite rightly points out. Bolshevism being, of course, a dictatorship of the proletariat, Nazism uh, a dictatorship with a voting consensus behind it. Um, point four, uh, Vladimir's book, I think, offers a very moving analysis, a chilling analysis, as one reviewer has said, of a century in which mankind aimed to reach the promised land through the power of ideas. And it reminds us that ideas are often translated into the most horrendous of deeds. <coughs> a fifth point, uh, Vladimir asks in chapter four, so why did the communist regimes collapse? And 
his answer is multi-causal. I'm not going to read them all out. There are several. But one cause which perhaps I missed was the um, admission by Gorbachev when he went to East Berlin in October 1989 that the Soviet Union would no longer prop up the East German communist regime. And I think that sent a signal to several of the re satellite regimes in East Central Europe that um, they were on their own, that it was up to them to uh, cope with the uh, economic situation that was facing them, with the uh, disillusion that had permeated many sectors of society in um, several of those countries. A sixth point is a one that relates to contemporary ethnic nationalism, which, again, Vladimir mentions in Chapter 6. Um, I quote from him, To be sure, the past is often used to justify the resentful fantasies of nationalist demagogues. This return of history is, however, more of an ideological reconstruction meant to respond to present-day grievances than a seemingly primordial destiny of nations destined to continuously fight with and fear, with, and fear each other. End of quote from Vladimir. Um, I would argue here that since the 19th century, all nations have shown that they worry, that they fret about their history, and often they do so giving more importance to opinions than to facts. Before the advent of fascism and communism in the area of East Central Europe, many historians assumed the mantle of defending uh, the idea of the nation state, and it was that idea that all that a particular group of people who shared uh, maybe a religion, but certainly who shared a common language, should live under a single political roof. And that idea was carried forward in much of the history writing uh, of the 19th century in Europe. Um, let me just quote from a Greek historian of the mid-19th uh, mid century, Konstantinos Paparagopoulos, who wrote that history is not only a science, it is at once the gospel of the present and the future of the motherland. And indeed, we might look at Bulgarian, Romanian, Czech, Hungarian, Polish historians with that in mind. Um, I might add here that although there has been a great deal of study of the manner in which communist historians perverted the historiography of the past in their countries, there's been very little analysis of how fascist historians looked at their own past and how they distorted it in their own turn. Finally, um, Vladimir's most perceptive conclusion that political myths are, be, are to be judged not in terms of their truthfulness, but of their potential to become true. Speaking about civil society led to the emergence of a civil society. And in East Central Europe, exhilarating new ideas such as the return to Europe destroyed obsolete ideas. And I think that's one of the many um, fascinating and innovative points that Vladimir makes, um, I think, in this most um, inspirational study. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, and finally, we hear from Charles King, who's a current uh, Wilson Center Fellow and a professor of international affairs and government at Georgetown University. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be a part of this um, panel and to congratulate Vladimir on on uh, on a, a really remarkable book that I would um, encourage you to read and perhaps more importantly encourage you to buy, uh, which is available outside uh, at the end of uh, end of our uh, panel today. Um, it's really a, a tour de force, I think, of political philosophy. Um, a deeply learned, erudite uh, commentary on the major ideas of the 20th century, the whole swirl of uh, intellectual predispositions uh, and ideas that informed uh, the two great political movements of that, of that century. Uh, and also uh, the way in which those ideas, as Vladimir said in his uh, presentation, have resonance even beyond uh, the short 20th century, even beyond the end of uh, communism in, in Eastern Europe. Vladimir himself is, is, of course, someone who has been at the center uh, of many of the debates that he, uh, that he speaks of, not only uh, because he 
has known so many of the of the great thinkers of the century with whom he interacted, uh, who were in some ways mentors to him, friends of his, uh, but also uh, because, of course, of his coming of age in one of the systems that he describes in, in communist Romania during some of the darkest days of that version of totalitarianism. And then, of course, more recently, his role in what, uh, what I think in the future he will be known for in addition to his scholarship, having chaired something that in Romania is now called the Tismananu Commission. Uh, that is the presidential commission that produced the first report on the history of Romanian communism, um, validated, if you like, by the president, debated in probably the most raucous um, parliamentary session uh, ever held in, uh, in, in Bucharest, uh, and that marked, I think, the beginning of that country's departure uh, from, uh, indeed, from the communist system and the beginning of its, of its real serious reckoning with its own communist past. Uh, the Devil in History, sort of, despite the title, I think, is not principally, uh, in my mind, about the problem of, of evil Although uh, in, in the world. Although, as uh, Vladimir said, one has to kind of have theology in mind when thinking about uh, two systems that produced so much evil in the world. One can't help but ask that basic theocrat the theological question of why evil exists and what, uh, what humans are meant to do about it. But it really is at base, it seems to me, a book about uh, the role of ideas in the world. How do we understand the power of ideas to work themselves out, in a Hegelian sense, um, in, in the world? How do we understand two systems whose chief commonality was that they promised the idea of our own ability, humans' ability, to think ourselves into a better world. Um, because there was a kind of, uh, and I'll come on to this in a, in, in a moment, there was at least the delusion of humanity at the core of both systems. Both systems talked about justice, both of, both of them talked about creating a more reasonable world, which was a, a favorite fascist word, actually, a reasonable way of living in the world. Both of them, of course, talked about truth with a capital T. Both of them came out of particular readings uh, of history. And this is, this is the kind of, this is the, the, the devil idea, um, I think, which, as Vladimir was saying, he owes to Leszek Kowalkowski, the idea of the devil in history being an idea, a way of seeing the world working itself out in history, in the end for, for nefarious purposes, but an, a set of ideas that claim to have a monopoly on justice, reasonableness, and truth. And both of these systems, of course, put a premium on ideas as, an, as a kind of actual material force in the world. Both of them privileged the role of ideas uh, in, in a way that perhaps it's, it's even difficult for us uh, to, uh, to, to recall unless we're um, ourselves engaged in the study of, of these systems and of this, of this period. Well, the similarities are clear, and the book goes into them in great detail, two systems that were deeply anti-liberal, that were deeply anti-democratic, in fact, that believed that they were the successors, in a way, to democracies. The democracy had a role in the world, had a role in history, um, but of course, democracy had, had reached the end of its, of, of its historical role, and either fascism or communism were going then to, to, to take over in human history. They romantically sought a kind of total sense of community. They were totalizing ideologies in, in this sense. They believed at least in theory, that they had the power to control all of human society and reshape it. But in the end, they had a commitment <coughs> also not just to reshaping that society or reshaping the state, but also to remaking human nature. Both ideologies or sets of ideas were amazingly optimistic then about the ability of states, of parties, to reshape humanity itself, to reshape the, the, the fundaments of, of human nature. Uh, totalitarianism as a word is also, I think, resurrected in Vladimir's book. Uh, some of you will recall the debates in political science in the 1980s and 1990s um, about that very term. And in fact, um, a, uh, a, a, de a degree of caution in the political science of that era about even using 
the term, rejecting it for authoritarian or autocratic or extreme authoritarian. One, in fact, in political science discussions now about transitions to democracy, um, uh, very rarely, if ever, do you see the word totalitarianism even even mentioned. And I think Vladimir is right to, resur to resurrect it. It would seem very odd, of course, not to put a Hitler or a Stalin or an Eichmann or a Beria um, in some category other than totalitarian. What other label could you possibly use? Authoritarian simply doesn't, doesn't do, do the trick. Uh, and I think he's also right to, to point out that, that comparison itself is kind of the beginning of, of understanding. Uh, in, in, in his presentation, Vladimir was quoting uh, Tim Snyder, who has, I think, a very good line on this, a very funny line, actually, on it. Tim's, what Tim always says is that w when you talk about the incomparability of communism and fascism, or in the incomparability uh, of mass killing under fascist regimes and mass killing under communist regimes, what one is really saying there is, I've compared the two systems and I'd prefer that you didn't. Um, it's, one's not making any other logical statement other than that, as Vladimir said, I've already done the comparing for you and I would rather that you didn't do it for, for yourself. Um, and I think what also these debates about comparability or incomparability, I think, uh, lead us to is, in fact, a mistake in the way that we, uh, that we view the 20th century. And Vladimir, uh, Vladimir, I think, is very, very good about pointing this out that one way of thinking about the 20th century, and it's in fact a way that I think you know, school children in the United States often are taught 20th century um, uh, world history, is that the great struggle, the great ideological struggle, the struggle of systems was between communism and fascism. When, of course, for so many of the thinkers that Vladimir deals with in, in, in this book, uh, that really wasn't the issue at all. It was, it, it was this sort of Popperian distinction between open societies and closed societies. This was actually the great dividing line in the 20th century. And open societies took a particular kind of form. Closed societies took multiple forms, actually. But the divide was not between communism and fascism. They actually fell on the same side of the open, closed uh, divide. Having said all of this, let me raise two sort of baskets of, of questions uh, that uh, perhaps Vladimir can deal with in the, um, in the discussion period and, um, and uh, will we'll launch us into a, a wider ranging uh, conversation. First of all, uh, is the question about whether we are best to understand the history of totalitarianism as a problem of ideas. Um, whether Vladimir is arguing that, in fact, that's the, our principal window into this problem or simply the window that he has chosen to go through in this particular book. And, of course, he has written in his other work about the way in which these systems work themselves out on the ground in a very micro way. But I wonder whether ideas, in fact, are um, um, uh, not, not just the best way, but perhaps even a good way of approaching the history of these, of these two systems. Because the, the particular historical context that both systems evolved through and out of seems to me to matter a great deal as well. For example, communism was a system, we have to remember, that came to power through war. In both uh, the uh, Soviet case, in the Russian Civil War, and in the East European context through either civil war in Albania or Yugoslavia or war and occupation for most of the rest of the region. Fascism, on the other hand, was a system that came to power in order to make war. War was itself one of the tools of the system rather than one of the contexts in, it, in, in, in which it came to power. And I think this is a very important distinction to make between the two systems because I think that historical context accounts for a great deal of the difference between the systems as they develop, not just as systems of ideas or ideologies, but actually really existing political systems in the world that affected uh, people's lives. In fact, one can read, in, read the early history of communism in both the Soviet Union and in East Central Europe as an effort from the very beginning to adapt a system born of war to the demands of peacetime governance. 
That is, the transition, for example, from war communism to the new economic policy. The transition from collectivization through the dizzy with success speech to uh, what came later. The transition from the Great Patriotic War to de-Stalinization. This is a system that constantly sought to readapt itself after the war generating experience that made it into, into a really existing political system. There's no similar history, it seems to me, for, for fascism. Fascism was a rather different thing. It didn't come uh, to power on the heels of war and therefore had at its core no need for constant reinvention and readaptation. That's a w another way of answering, in, in a sense, the question, the very important question, provocative question, I think, that Vladimir poses, which is, why is it so difficult to imagine a revisionist fascism? Certainly possible to imagine, in fact, really existed, revisionist communism, even revisionist Stalinism, for, for, for that matter. It seems a sort of contradiction in terms ridiculous to think of, of, of revisionist fascism. Or if there is such a thing, it just reduces to Italian nationalism or German nationalism. Um, the opposition to Hitler comes from old conservative nationalists, not from revisionist fascists, if, if you like. Well, one way of answering that question is to, to stay in the realm of ideas. For example, that it's very difficult to adapt the Führer principle, the, the leadership principle, the Führer principle. How could you possibly adapt that in a revisionist context? I mean, if your system is so focused on the power and the place of the individual leader, um, thinking of a revisionist version of that, at least while that leader is still alive and in power, is difficult to, to, to think through. Or you could make the, uh, the Aron argument, which, which uh, Vladimir pointed to as well, that th a key distinction between these two systems was that one was uh, evil by its very nature, the other was evil in its implementation. That is to say, it had a kind of core humanity to it that was eventually in its implementation perverted. There is, in other words, no equivalent of the 1848 manuscripts of Marx that, that you could sort of appeal to if you were a revisionist uh, fascist. I'm skeptical about staying in the realm of ideas and explaining this, and perhaps more optimistic about our finding an answer in the way in which these systems evolved on, on the ground for one simple reason, and it, and, it, and it has to do with the way in which the makers of these systems, below the level of the ideologists and the party leaders, thought about what they were doing. Um, if you, you haven't had a chance to see this new book that Dennis and I were just talking about a bit earlier, Soldaten, which is the, uh, the a remarkable new book on the, uh, that is taken from the uh, German POW transcripts that were uh, of, of recordings that were made in secret uh, of German POWs by uh, both British and American interrogators during the Second World War. What you see is, what you have there is a kind of window into the way in which uh, both Wehrmacht and SS average soldiers and officers were thinking about what they were up to. And what is so chilling about reading those transcripts is the idea that from the perspective of those on the ground actually making the killing, doing the occupation in, uh, in, in Poland, Ukraine, and elsewhere, is the idea that they believed they had a core humanity uh, at the base of what they were, they were doing. A sense of humane regret. It was awful, of course, what one had to do to the Jews. It was awful what one had to do to partisans or Bolsheviks. But at the end of the day, one had a kind of historical burden to bear. Um, and that the world would become more just, the world would become more reasonable, the world would be filled with more truth and beauty if they could bear this burden and stand it long, uh, long enough. A kind of core and perverted morality that they believed that they were, uh, they were in, in, inhabiting, uh, a moral core that they, um, in some ways, felt that they had to, f felt that they had to over, overcome. Um, so, to, to me, I think there is a great deal that we can learn, obviously, by, by looking at the way in which a set of ideas interact with each other, but I think we have to, have to marry that in a way, if we're going to have an understanding of what totalitarianism was as a system, with what the makers of it at all kinds of levels believed that they were doing at any given time, and the real-world constraints 
uh, that they faced as they were trying, uh, trying to, to, to implement um, these systems. Second basket of issues um, has to do with the, um, not with the onset of totalitarianism, but in fact with its fate, with, with what ultimately happened to these systems um, in the end. Um, I think for, for Vladimir, in, in this book, the end of communism is really about the evaporation of self-confidence. It's that the, the end of this kind of commitment to utopia, the system, the ideas that, that motivated these systems um, ultimately ran out of steam. There was not enough revisionism to revive them. There was not enough faith in them to keep them going. Uh, Stephen Kotkin uh, makes a kind of uh, an allied argument, if you like, when he says in his last book that the system decayed from the top rather than from below. We were enamored of, of course, thinking about crowds in the, in, in, in the street, and, and 1989 in particular as being about a popular uprising, but in so many ways 1989 had at its core 1956, that is to say, a, 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 the, the sense at the top of the system that the, that the ideas that had motivated it simply could not hold uh, any longer. But to me, again, I think the, the structure and context are supremely powerful here. And perhaps if, if, if I were weighing things, I would say structure and context might matter more than the ideas at the core of the system. The communist system, for example, was committed to reforming itself from the very beginning, or at least from the beginning of the idea of socialism in one country. It was committed to the idea of adapting itself to local conditions. Or another way of putting it is communism was a kind of universal system that found itself, by dint of history, forced to become particular, to adapt itself to the individual circumstances once after 1919 or 1920 or so, the idea of a universal revolution spreading out from the Russian center uh, to the rest of the world uh, was, was clearly um, defunct as an idea. Fascism was a very different thing. Fascism was a deeply particularistic system that, by dint of history, forced itself to become imperial, but not universal. Imperial is a sort of language that Mark Mazower uses in his Hitler's Empire book. It had a different set of constraints on it and a different set of um, uh, in, in a way, imperatives built into the system. Um, in some cases, this, the, 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 these reformist trends or these adapt, a, adaptive trends within communism actually forced communism to become deeply national. Um, and, and of course, Vladimir knows this uh, be better than anyone else. The, 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 the real second life of totalitarianism came within the communist system, um, uh, particularly in Southeast Europe, uh, when communist uh, leaders discovered that by becoming more particularistic, by becoming more national in the way that they thought about their own ends, uh, they could actually preserve themselves, steel themselves against the threat of revisionist uh, communism. So in this sense, I wonder if, if we're looking for precursors of 1989, one way to think about things is that the precursors lay in the long history of humane socialism. The precursors to 1989 lay in revisionist communism, in Eurosocialism, uh, in philosophical approaches uh, to Marxism. They lay in the 1848 manuscripts. They lay in some of the great leftist uh, thinkers and in, in uh, uh, revisionists in, in Hungary, in uh, Czechoslovakia, in France, um, and elsewhere. Or you might say, as, as of course the makers of 1989 on the ground felt, the real precursor to 1989 was 1968 that that had represented the culmination of a set of ideas about humane socialism that was ultimately, uh, a set of ideas that was ultimately destroyed uh, by, uh, by conservatives within the, uh, within the party and state elite. But I wonder if, in fact, the real precursors to 1989 lie perhaps not in 1968, but in 1948 and 1958. That is to say, much earlier efforts of this system to adapt itself to local needs. In 1948, 
the uh, Tito-Stalin split, uh, when you already have the communist system giving up um, any pretense of being uh, any more than a, a set of allied movements in the world rather than part of a single totalitarian system. Uh, or in 1958, I simply picked 58 because that's when uh, the last Soviet troops leave uh, Romania and allow the country to begin to go, really go its own way and indigenize itself um, in, uh, in, in ways that uh, had only been seen previously in Albania and Yugoslavia. So in other words, I think um, the debate is still open about the role of ideas and accounting for the power of totalitarianism, the trajectories of totalitarianism. Vladimir, I think, gives a brilliant account of the way in which both systems relied on a set of common assumptions, common trajectories, common phobias and obsessions, if you like, uh, when it comes to the role of ideas in the world. Um, I wonder, uh, though, if, uh, if we need to add to that uh, a sense of structure and context if we're trying to understand the ways in which the ability of people to think themselves into a better world uh, turned out to be uh, far less than they, than they might have imagined. Uh, so just, it remains for me just to congratulate Vladimir on, on what I think is a deeply intelligent, a deeply erudite, uh, and perhaps most importantly, and this is a word that we don't often use in scholarship, but a deeply humane um, approach to understanding what at the end of the day uh, was some of the most monumental human suffering uh, of, uh, of, of the century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, um, and I'll open the floor for discussion. So if you have a question, please raise your hand um, and uh, wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Any, any takers? Uh, yeah, let's start up here. Please also introduce yourself for the benefit of our speakers. Uh, yes, Ron R Radosh, Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you for a really brilliant presentation, an absolutely wonderful book as well, which I'm not quite through reading, but will be soon. Uh, I want to address myself to, to some of the questions Charles King uh, made on uh, Vladimir's talk. Uh, and the question that Vladimir raised, could there be uh, could there have been an equivalent of the Khrushchev speech by Martin Bormann or another Nazi leader? Uh, but you do have, as Charles said, in Marxism, a, a whole group of people who call themselves Marxist humanists who claim, I mean, Eric, the late Eric Fromm in America came from Germany. They put their emphasis on the economic and philosophical manuscripts, on the theme of alienation. And they say that is the true Marx, that this Marx uh, was an individualist who believes in freely created associational communities. It's Leninism that created uh, the error in misreading of Marx. And they claim that uh, theirs is the real Marxism and the others are false. Uh, so I'd like. Uh, a dis uh, discussion of that. The other thing that occurs to me, uh, just the theme in Vladimir, when I was on the left, and indeed on the communist left, half a century ago almost, uh, I remember going to a talk by a now f f f thankfully forgotten uh, pro-communist journalist named Anna Louise Strong, who edited in Moscow in the 40s and 50s, Moscow News, the propaganda organ in English for pro-communist Americans to gl glamorize the Soviet Union. And then she went to China after the Chinese Revolution, uh, got in trouble, was expelled, went back to Russia, and was about to be arrested. She, I forget the details of how she got out to the United States, but I did go to hear her speak in New York City. And the whole pro-communist press and media in the United States, which still had some force to it, called her a traitor, and uh, totally would have nothing to do with her, but she managed to rent a hall in New York and give this speech, and she said that she didn't care. If she, she herself had been arrested, tortured, and killed, it would have been valid because communism is like an express train going down the track, reaching its destination. As the train goes down the track, it, it passes, Fly, flies on the track and it 
kills them as the track goes over the flies. And I'm just like a fly on the path to communism. And if I had to be killed, if I had not gone out to the United States, it would have been right. Uh, I remember that because it was such, to me, one of the things that began to open my eyes, such a chilling, insane comment. Uh, maybe we can collect a couple more right up here. My name is Stephen Shore. I must echo Mr. Radish's comment, something I might not have thought I would ever would do, but um, that, that, you, that there is this strong religious component. I'm reminded of, it, it was certainly a, a, patholo a pathologic religion, but nonetheless, these were, these religions had millions of adherents, and I'm reminded of Kersler's Darkness at Noon, where Ribeshoff goes to his death thinking that his death is for the good of the party that having essentially the party as the sole arbiter of good, that why on earth resist the party because his own resistance is uh, 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 not fulfilling the greater good. So I think, it, I don't know how much religion M -M goes into, is used in your book, but I cursely certainly quotes the mind of the inquisitors of the Con Council of Constance, who, you know, who, who said that, you know, leave morality aside, we'll do whatever we need to, to um, so it, it, one could think of both fascism and communism as, the, as, as pathological excesses of religious belief. Do you want to take those questions? Do you want to Let's take another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw a hand on this side and then uh, in Let's the back of the room. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so very much for this presentation. Um, sort of looking fast forward, and uh, the notion of um, transition away from, uh, in that case, communism and the process of reconciliation. If we take the, a look at Romania, because I understand that uh, you have that case study in common, um, after 22 years of democracy, it seems that the, the country still has um, a lot to do with in, uh, on, on the way to reconciliation. Um, and Professor King mentioned the work of Professor Tismanianu uh, and the commission and how rocky and polarizing the process can be. And so how would you see that unfolding? And is, 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 has time come for that reconciliation? And what, what, would, what would the process be away from a totalitarian um, regime such as communism? Thank you. Ken Dante, just to refine the religious question, could you look at it as a messianic movements of the 20th century and even kind of industrial mechanistic uh, uh, messianic movements that attempt to recreate mankind in almost machine-like form so that everything works around this machine-like center, but messianic movements, almost robotic, I guess. Robot messiah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Richard Kitterman, and I'm an intern here. And I guess my my main question is: Where is do you see any kind of resurgence of fascism or communism in the future? Because the basically because the narrative that I got in grade school all the way up to high school is that fascism and communism were defeated in the mid to late. 20th century fascism in the middle of the century, communism at the end of the century, and things like Fukuyama, the idea of liberalism being triumphant, and now we're more internationalized. But do you think that fascism or communism could come back either distinctly or some, or some kind of conflated totalitarian ideology? Well, okay. We have, what, five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that should be another another uh, whole session. Okay, so uh, I'll try to wrap up a little bit and I'll say the following. Okay, yes. Uh, there's a collection of books, quite interesting stuff there, uh, published by a British, um, a British uh, publishing house and it's called, I think the whole collection is called uh, The Idea of Communism. That's the title of the collection. And you have there piece, uh, books, little books by uh, Tariq Ali, by Slavenka Draculic, by there's a very interesting book about the uh, Indonesian coup d'etat 
in September 1965. So it's a uh, collection, clearly, with a particular uh, direction. Uh, in that collection, Tariq Ali, who is a well-known uh, scholar and scholar of Stalinism and philosopher and many other things, probably many other hats he's wearing, uh, wrote a little book which is you know, about what remains of the idea of communism. And he quotes an Italian, one of the most interesting Italian Marxists, and you know, uh, one has to admit that in the 20th century, when Marxists got so stultified and so ossified and so fossilized, Italian Marxism remained one of the less stultified, fossilized, and mummified, whatever you want to call it, petrified, okay? So this particular guy, who broke with the Italian Communist Party, they created the group Il Manifesto, Il Lucio Magri, very intelligent guy. Uh, when asked, you know, basically, uh, the what remains of the communist idea. After all, was it defeated? To answer your question, he went back to a parable, a poem by Bertolt Brecht, and um, uh, it's the history of the. I apologize for those who know it. I find it excellent. So Bertolt Brecht was the author. The other day we went to my wife is there Bethesda to a French restaurant. I was listening to the music on the street, and it was of course a three penny opera. So Bertolt Brecht of three penny three penny opera reputation, if nothing else. Okay. So Brecht, in one of his uh, pedagogical poems, uh, says the following story. It's a poem in prose. It's not a uh, rhyme poem. Okay. So he says it's the story of the tailor of Ulm, a city in Germany. Germany was a multi, you know, multi-state uh, empire, if you want. We are in the Middle Age. There were 500 principalities or so. And in the city of Ulm, this tailor goes to the bishop and announces the bishop, uh, I can fly. And the bishop says, really? And the guy says, absolutely, I can fly. So the bishop says, OK, let's call all the citizens of Ulm to go to the main square. And you are going to fly from the top tower of the church and show that you can fly. So the tailor of Ulm, he was a tailor by profession, okay, so he goes to the top place there and starts, attempts to fly, right? And what happens? He doesn't fly, he falls down and dies, okay, he's crushed. What is Brecht's conclusion to that? 500 years later, planes were flying in the skies. Got the point? Okay. Uh, so, Okay, so for those who want to believe, the belief system remains because communism and fascism respond. And I am grateful that you mentioned Arthur Kessler here. I, I engage in a deep dialogue, I hope, with one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th century in, in the book and not only there. Uh, you know, communism, there's a very famous scene that you can find it in... Uh, actually in some, uh, who wrote the biography of Whitaker Chamber, some time house, right? Okay. Uh, at a certain moment, uh, Arthur Kessler, Whitaker Chambers, and Margarete Buber Neumann, all the three with impeccable anti-communist you know, credentials, get together in a French bistro in 1961 or 1962. At a certain moment, one of them, makes, let's say Whitaker Chambers says, uh, and still, do you remember when we called each other Kamarad? <laughs> so these guys, after so many fights, and so on, they still have something in memory of, and this is the basic question, that a book that I quote less so in this, but it's my, my, one of my favorite books. And this is about the 20th century. It's uh, the book by, uh, a, a book of conversations between uh, a Polish poet, about whom, by the way, Tim Snyder's wife wrote the mm -hmm. wonderful Masi, Masi Shore about caviar and ashes, about the generation of Alexander Watt. Some of you may have read, it's a wonderful book. Conversation between Czeslav Miłosz, who is the interviewer, and Alexander Watt, W-A-T. Okay, Alexander Watt was a uh, modernist Polish poet who became communist and so on. And asked what is the mystery there, and it's the same mystery why people engage in religious uh, leap of faith. The mystery there, it's, you know, remember how the essay by Kessler starts in The God That Failed. You do not join a religion in a rational way. A religion, you know, it's a conversion. Conversions are infrarational things. You know, you don't argue with the true believer. You don't argue with Osama bin Laden rationally. Okay, so it's a very complicated element there. So to try to understand, that's what Dostoevsky tried to teach us in The Demons. 
which I think is the book I tried with my students. It didn't work that well in my graduate seminar, because I think it's the most important book for understanding the mind of the terrorist. I think that in addition to all the other things that we study about terrorist structure and context and, uh, and deep roots and so on and so forth, I think that it's very important to understand what kind of mindset operates there. What is the mindset of, you know, what is the title of Doris Lessing's book, The Good Terrorist, okay? What is the, what, what is mobilizing, what is the driving force there? So, uh, okay, um, the question that uh, Flavius Mihaes came was the uh, problem of reconciliation after, so let's post-traumatic memory. Uh, this is a major problem in Germany, and as we know, Germany has still is still in the process of this is not, first of all, this is not happening fast. It took France, your country, original country, it took France the period between 1945 and 1995, as Annette Vievorka demonstrated in her presentation at a conference we organized here at the Wilson Center two, two years ago, no? Okay, it took France with the whole period between the first de Gaulle government and Jacques Chirac in 1995 to apologize in the name of the French state for the Valdiv, for, for, you know, that's a film is playing now, and, you know, about the, the raf, la rafle, well, how to translate rafle, mm -hmm. Flavius, the, la rafle, okay, the, 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 the big, uh, what is round it? Up. Ground up, yeah. round up, okay, the big round up, okay, which entered French memory. Everybody knew about that, but the French state did not say sorry until Jacques Chirac in 1995. Neither the gold, the great, figure of resistance, nor Mitterrand with his very ambiguous relationship to resistance and then collaboration and so on, nor whoever, Giscard d'Estaing, Pompidou, whoever, uh, Mandes France, nobody, the Fourth Republic, I mean, people with impeccable democratic credentials like Pierre Mandes France, no, wouldn't touch the issue. So Vichy was a kind of parenthesis, occupation was a kind of parenthesis and so on. We know the reactions to the, the, the film by Alain René, no? uh, and Marcelo Fulz and all the rest. So I think that for this, for this, what Germany realized was a kind of, let's call it, uh, national atonement. It was, it has happened in Germany. It uh, is not happening in, the, in Russia. In the post-communist societies, there's a wonderful book, I reviewed it in The National Affairs by David Satter, uh, uh, that came out, actually, it's Alexander Etkin that reviews it in the most recent TLS, and the title says everything. Uh, it's called, It Took Place a Long Time Ago, and Anyway, It Doesn't Matter. It took place a long time ago, and anyway, who cares? Okay, so uh, the point is that Satter makes, and uh, apropos of ideas, to respond to, thank you very much, both Dennis and Charles, for the comments, and I wrote very detailed, I took very de detailed notes. Uh, I think that, you know, of course, this is always a matter of, you know, it's like, how do I say, what was first? Obviously, ideas do, are generated by structures and context, and they change structure and context. Uh, probably as a reaction, which is a normal thing since I was uh, fed with Marxist ideas and Hegelian. No, Hegel had <laughs> a different approach to ideas. Okay, so I think that I tend to emphasize, and because of, of course, I am, you know, very much influenced by Aron and by Isaiah Berlin and so on, and we just published in translation to remain of The Power of Ideas by Isaiah Berlin. So it's very, very much, I do think that, I do, that's the way I think. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. We had, we have one student here. We, I'm teaching now a seminar, uh, and he will say it's a great seminar because he has no other choice, uh, okay, about film, whatever it's called, dictators, dictatorships, and film. And one of the films that I presented to them, uh, very interested since you mentioned Fukuyama. Fukuyama is on, uh, on the record. Was, he reviewed some book in the New York Times book review, and he said in that review that his students at Stanford at this moment couldn't care less about 20th century history. If you remember that, we found it, the quotations. I mean, truly they are not interested in that. I don't have this experience at the University of Maryland. I'm wondering what your experiences are at Georgetown. Uh, mixed, no? Yeah, yeah. Mixed. Okay, probably at our yeah. school also mixed. Anyway, I presented the film Pokoyang, Atonement, which is a film, the at Atonement, which was a, uh, what was translated? Repentance. 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 Mm -hmm. It was the most important, it's the title basically of Leon Aron's new book, which is called Road to the Temple. Okay, Leon Aron is a scholar at American Enterprise. You know no, he is. Okay, the Yeltsin biographer and so on. So Leon's new book published by Yale University Press is called Roads to the Temple because the last metaphor in the film is precisely 
a, an old woman who comes. I'm sure people remember that was the great film of Glasnost. I mean, that really set the agenda of Glasnost. <coughs> you know, and actually, he took it as a title of his film, Road to the Temple, because the question is, an old woman, it's in a post, it's an imagined republic, which could be Georgia under Stalin or Italy under Mussolini or whatever, under Beria, sorry. Okay, so the main character is a dictator that combines Mussolini, Beria, Stalin, Hitler, you remember it, okay? So, and after so many years, it was very refreshing to see it you know, it still works, okay? It, being a masterpiece, it works, okay? So, so the old woman at the end comes with the question, what, where is the road to the temple? To the church, actually. What is the road? Where is the road to the church? And somebody says, there is no road to the church. I think that's the last line, no? And she says, if there is no road to the church, what is life for? Okay, so uh, Leon being, you know, probably the, the editor, Yale being very correct, changed the church into the temple. That's in the film, it's to the church, sorry. It should crumb. It should have remained the church, even if we wanted. But of course, we know that the University Press has always this, you know, very, very, how do I say, purifying more of editing. And, you know, so it became, the church became the temple, very universal. Okay, so the road to the church, that was the question. So where, what is the road to the spiritual salvation? Okay, so the spiritual salvation, the, you know, that, that's a thing that happens in one's, in, in the human soul, and also it involves the state. The problem of involving the state, and here since Charles mentioned my role in the Truth Commission, no, it was the Truth Commission in Romania, not quotation marks, it was truly the equivalent of, it was a Truth Commission. And truth commissions are very controversial. Truth commissions are not an easy job. I always say, and Charles wrote a review of our report in Slavic Review, a wonderful review. Uh, I always said if I had known all the implications of that, probably I would have had very serious reservations. Especially if I had known Francis, if I had read Francisco Goldman's uh, novel about the truth commission in Guatemala, and the title is "The Death of the Archbishop." <laughs> who was the head of the Truth Commission, and after the Truth Commission presented its report, the Archbishop drove home and was shot dead in the garage of the building. That's a fact. Okay, so Truth Commissions are not just, you know, uh, done, you know, as Lenin used to say, life is not just a promenade on Nevsky Prospect. <laughs> so uh, Truth Commissions are not just a walk on Fifth Avenue. Okay, so it's a very serious thing, and you provoke. Okay, we still have... I wanted to answer messianic versus mechanistic. That's a very interesting question. Uh, the problem, uh, both, both, and we cannot. Of course, my commentators were wonderful in summarizing and and and, and offering, uh, I think, very thoughtful uh, suggestions. Not I don't take them as cr criticism, but suggestions. Uh, both ideologies that we deal with, uh, probably less so Mussolini. But let's leave it because I hear I focus primarily, although I have a lot about Mussolini served me very, very well because he gave the best definition of fascism. So I don't need an extra definition. But the reviewer in the Daily Beast says Vladimir Tisman doesn't come with a new definition. Why would I have a new one when Mussolini gave me the perfect definition of fascism? Okay, I'm very happy with that definition. I don't need an extra one. Okay. So but seriously <laughs> speaking, uh, the both movements. Of course, they were youth-oriented and so on. That's a very complicated thing, uh, if I may, uh, among other things, uh, one of my hats is a political philosopher. So uh, in his, uh, in his um, uh, Specters of Karl Marx, the late French uh, post-structuralist philosopher Jacques Derrida uh, starts with a superb analysis of uh, the, uh, the myth of the ghost or the phantom or the specter, and he compares the specter in the Communist Manifesto to the specter in the first act of Hamlet. It's a superb piece of literary criticism. I don't discuss it differently. But what he says is basically that the specter in uh, the Communist Manifesto is a future-oriented specter. The specter of communism looks into the... Okay. If you just allow me to think of Hamlet's father being a specter of romanticism, and national socialism being a neo-romantic, in many respects, a neo-romantic movement, okay, it's very much a past-oriented. Even if they project, the, the future is a recreation of the past, okay, in the national socialist ideology. Okay, so uh, to answer the question about messianic, both have the messianic, both replace the human time, which 
Now it's 5.05, that's human time, into they introduce the messianic time, which is a very different. We go into philosophy here, and this is basically where people like Carl Schmitt on that side and Walter Benjamin on that side, both of them dealt with the problem of messianic time. And contemporary philosophers, George Ogamben and other people, are working on this problem of mess what is messianic time, the revolutionary time, the chiliastic time, when time concentrates or whatever, very differently than under normal circumstances. Both were scientific movements. Both claimed to have scientific answers to huma humans. Both Karl Marx, by finding the objective laws, remember, I always tell my students, what is the, uh, you know, Andrew is there, uh, Engels' speech to Karl Marx's grave. I always say, go and read it. Whom does Engels compare Karl Marx in the speech in 1883 at Highgate Cemetery when they buried Karl Marx? to Charles Darwin. He was the Darwin of social science. So basically, he was a scientist. Hitler in Mein Kampf, or if you want to go into more sophisticated people like Houston Stewart, Chamberlain, and the sources of Hitler, they claimed to have discovered scientific laws. The ra laws of race are seen, eugenics, the euthanasia, and so on. They're all part of this. Now, I, uh, uh, Charles. And then we'll continue the discussion when we'll get together for lunch or dinner and we can discuss this. Mm -hmm. I read, and we both write and read uh, the T TLS. Uh, you are familiar with the uh, recent uh, discussions about who were the majority of the people who worked for RHSA, which was the most important directorate of SS. Okay, AS Hasha. Okay, uh, so those were the people who made up the L, um, whatever, Einsatzkommandos. Mm -hmm. Those were the people who committed, if Tim Snyder is right and he is right, most of the crimes which were not recorded for a long time that took place in some of you who saw whatever, everything is illuminated or read a book. Okay, the crimes that took place in the killing fields of Ukraine and Belarus, not at Auschwitz, not at bergen belsen not at whatever uh, Treblinka, but in the killing fields and unrecorded. And pro it's what Snyder, and you quote him, is called what? The Holocaust by bullets. Mm -hmm. The Holocaust by bullets. Okay? Uh, okay, the majority of those people were law PhDs. They held law degrees before 1933 or immediately after 1933 in law. They were highly educated and they were true believers. Okay, so the power of ideas, and with this I'll finish, we presented among the films that we present, we presented Downfall, to the, I present to my class. And some of you remember Bruno Gantz's extraordinary performance and so on and so forth. There is the moment when Magda Goebbels basically poisons her five children. And the doctor, the SS doctor, whoever, says, are you sure you want to do it? I mean, why do you want? And her answer for me encapsulates the whole problem. Her answer is, I don't want them to live in a world without national socialism. A mother poisoning, and otherwise she's perfectly normal. Her, all her behavior is perfectly normal. That's what ideology can do. The person behaves perfectly normal. Uh, Svetlana Alilueva, in her memoirs, describes uh, Vasily Blochin, the worst executioner in, uh, in Stalin's Russia, as the nicest guy. He, she was playing with him, and he was bringing her very nice dolls and so on. Okay, this is the guy who executed. He was very happy because in one day in Katyn, he personally murdered, and you remember the end of the film, okay? He personally murdered, I think, 1,000 people. Okay, just bullet in the... Yeah. Okay, so he was totally convinced that he was doing the right thing. Uh, Rethinking of the, all this, I went back to one of the best books written about Hitler and Stalin. It's Alan Bullock's parallel biographies of, of, of Hitler and Stalin, the great Hitler biographer. And when uh, it's in Ron, uh, if you go into Ron Rosenbaum's book, Explaining Hitler, and he interviews Alan Bullock. He says, at the end of the day, this great British historian who published his Hitler biography, the first ver ed edition in 58 or something like that, a classic. Hitler or, apropos of mechanism, the mechanisms of tyranny. Okay, so the, uh, uh, he says, uh, the question is, did he believe it? He was convinced and he says he was a mountebank, that's exactly his term, 
but he was the most convinced man mountebank ever. And that's Khrushchev when asked, did Stalin believe that he was a genuine Marxist Leninist when he was doing that? And Khrushchev responds, it's yes, and therein lies the whole tragedy. Okay, so Khrushchev who Dean was not particularly sophisticated, but he has this kind of, you know, deep, let's say, uh, humane understanding of certain things. So it's a, uh, this is the whole problem. I mean, do the terrorists who attack us think that they are uh, doing evil? No, they're doing the good. This is the whole problem. This is the problem of the de devil enforced. Uh, the, that, what is the line? That always tries to do the, I know it in German. And, uh, it's, 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 it's the motto to Mar Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. Okay, so it's Erist ein Teil jeder Kraft, so he is a part of that force. Uh, die nur das Gute will, that always wants the good, and nur das Böse schafft, and only the evil creates. Thank you very much. Thank you.